uh, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, thanks for that uh, glowing introduction. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague uh, Kay Godwin. Uh, Kay's regional business manager at RWA and she will be assisting and supporting me in the delivery of today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is principally focused on being informative. It should be thought provoking. Um, it's going to uh, highlight the key topic area of training and competency. Hopefully you'll find this session of value. Um, it's going to last approximately 45 minutes. There will be opportunity to ask questions as we go uh, and also at the end. So if you want to use the chat facility to raise any questions, any pertinent topics you may have, um, then we'll be more than happy to address those. So the objectives of today's session, uh, we're going to provide insight into the FCA approach to training and competency. We're going to explore the meaning of competence and what you need to do. So what are your firm's requirements? We're going to look a little bit at evidence in competency and how firms define their competency standards. And we're also going to get under the skin of what makes up a training and competence framework. So to set off, um, I've got a question for the audience, and that would be what is competency? Was there anybody that would like to volunteer their thoughts on what competency means to them? We'd uh, welcome your comments via the chat facility on this. Anything coming through, Chris? Anybody uh, volunteering anything at all? There's, there's nothing at the moment. Stunned I've got to, silence. I've, I've got to be honest, <laughs> competence is a word that we use within our business as well, but it is quite difficult to define, isn't it? It um, is, yes. Well, look, what, what we're going to do is we're going to get into that and I'll put, put some um, shape around competency. So let, let, let's move on and we'll have an explore of that. So uh, what does competency mean? Um, the FCA state that employees must be competent in the job role that they do and they must continue to maintain their competency throughout their employment with a regulated firm so being competent means that the firm must be able to demonstrate that an individual has the necessary knowledge skills and experience to do their job and that they are doing it to the required standards effectively and consistently so things such as sufficient knowledge firms will need to be able to identify what knowledge is required and enable um, a reasonably competent person to carry out their role uh, the knowledge must be relevant to the job that's been undertaken it's also good to develop knowledge but at the outset firms need to be able to demonstrate that the employee has the knowledge required to do their job what about skills and experience Employees need to be able to apply the knowledge that they have in an everyday work situation. It's no good an individual having lots of experience on paper, but in reality, not being able to apply that experience to the job that's in hand. An example that I would use would be, say, a, a Sunday League footballer. Um, they could have played up front for 750 times for the Sunday League football team. That doesn't mean if you lift them out of there and drop them into a Premier League football team, they're going to hit the ground running and start scoring lots of goals. You need to ensure that the experience is relevant to the role that's being undertaken. And once you satisfy that, that will enable a winning formula. OK, do you want to come in on knowledge? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So we'll just look at um, some of those components in more detail. So firstly, if we no look at knowledge, well, what does that mean in relation to, um, you know, uh, people that you've got in your broker firms doing their day to day job? So this could be um, technical knowledge of um, insurance, um, understanding, having knowledge of the basic principles of insurance and the insurance products um, that you sell. So the, the, the basic underlying principles that are common to all types of insurance products. Um, knowledge of the underlying legal principles of an insurance contract um, the regulatory requirements so those set by the regulator the fca um, and also possibly the ico as well for 
uh, data protection, etc. And also knowledge of your firm's specific procedures and processes. So the way that you your firm would like your staff to um, to deal with policies and their customers as well. Uh, in essence, it's just ensuring that each individual staff member possesses the minimum level of knowledge necessary to be able to undertake the individual role <laughs> that they're performing in your firm. Um, so also level of competency. So we'll look at that next. So each role demands a different level of competency. Um, you need to be able to assess your individual's knowledge and that needs to be specific to their role. You need to consider what the necessary standards that your firm has set for that role. And just bear in mind that not every employee no needs to know the same things nor do they need to have the same level of knowledge. So, for example, you wouldn't expect, say, an account handler prim primarily dealing with mo private motor insurance to have the same knowledge as an account executive that deals with complex business risk packages, for example. But quite often there will be an overlap. So you might have some individuals that are multi-skilled, depending on their role. So. They might deal with a uh, private motor client or private home and also deal with complex risks, commercial risks as well. So you need to make sure their competency uh, is up to the level to deal with all of those things. Um, next, let's look at um, understanding. So um, it's no use knowing lots of facts but you don't know where they're relevant. For example, your staff might know the calculation to work out average, uh, but you also need to know, they also need to know why it's important and where it's of value to provide the customer with the explanation of average, as well as knowing how to explain that fully to the customer. So we, we say there, it's, not, it's, it's no good just knowing it on paper. You've got to know when to apply it in the, the real world as well and break it down into understandable chunks that the, the customer can go away um, understanding what, you, what you've said. So uh, these three um, aspects of uh, this are why, where and how. Together, these form the basis of competency. So there's a few ways that you can assess knowledge. Uh, things like case studies. Um, so they could include the good, the bad and the ugly uh, sort of uh, examples and try and tie those in with simil similarities to the individual uh, person's job. So it can make it real and bring it to life for them. The more you can bring it to life, the more the person's going to be able to relate to it and understand. Uh, so role plays. This is uh, one that often you know, it's a bit of a, a bit of a cringe sort of one. Uh, you know, we think of David Brent in the office, which they're often uncomfortable, both for the person that's delivering it and for the recipient. However, they do work. Uh, once you get over the first bit of cringiness with role plays that, you know, people can take a lot away from 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 that and then they can apply it into their everyday jobs. Uh, File audits, so these provide an insight into whether your training's worked and if the individual's able to apply the knowledge that they've learned during the training, the case studies, the role plays into their everyday uh, role and the file audits will uh, back that up. Uh, coaching, so I know Chris said at the start you, uh, there were some sessions you've had on coaching as well. Uh, along with the ecclesiastical webinars. And this is a, a real good one as well. So training and coaching are different things. So training is the process of introducing knowledge of a new skill and coaching is using that skill so it can be applied in the most effective way. So if we think back again to Steve's analogy of the professional uh, sports team, like football team or cricket team or whatever, uh, they, they have head coaches. They don't have a head trainer. So, you know, the, the prerequisite is that the cricket player or the footballer already knows how to play football, but the coach brings along those skills and, and brings them up to uh, the standard um, needed. Uh, core listening. So side by side, this could be side by side core listening or remote listening. And again, think about the professional sports person. 
coaching can be delivered pitch side at the you know side of the pitch shouting um instructions stuff like that um and uh, so in the live environment but also they would have like a debrief session where they would be uh, analyze uh you know a video of the match and give coaching that way so that's the kind of thing you can do with remote listening and uh, you can listen to the call make notes and then have a session with the the person to to you know go through it with them and help them that way um yep yeah, thanks steve uh so and the application so we've introduced the concept of application so what is this so this is simply applying the knowledge and understanding that the individual has to their role that they're doing coaching can help put into practice what's been learned and think about live environments versus classroom environments so a rhetorical question to ask here would be how many of you today on, on this webinar do you have a training and competency regime embedded within your business uh, which exists of just subscription to say an online platform so if that's all you're doing just getting you, your staff or yourselves to do just online learning you probably well you are missing a key aspect of a robust training and competency framework so think about the con concept of observation and staff doing their job followed by feedback um, and how is this delivered in practice so listening to conversations between you and your team and clients is a very effective way to identify the barriers that prevent them from performing at their best by using observations from these calls you can start coaching sessions and resolving the barriers um, you could do mentoring so side by side mentoring sitting by someone while they take calls or they do files um, or a combination of both uh, works as well so another um, another way of um, demonstrating this and uh, evidencing it is setting what we call KPIs, so key performance indicators. So another question which we'd like to you to put in the chat now is uh, what's everyone's understanding of key performance indicators? So if you can put some comments in the chat, then we'll have a look what what people are putting in, and then we we can uh, talk through those as those come through. Thanks, Kay. And um, and just to, I, I feel I need to call them out, but Carl and Nikki responded to the first question as well from Steve and their answers were spot on, but it was just that I'd gone back on mute when they did. Okay. So um, <laughs> and we're, we're starting to get some responses back through on your question there, Kay. Uh, so from Keely, we've got goals, targets, where you want people to be. And from Lizzie, we've got something you measure and report on throughout the organisation. Brilliant. OK, uh, we, we've got file audit outcomes, individual targets, smart objectives. Who's that from? Uh, smart objectives was from Nick and file audit outcomes, individual targets was from Ashley. Fantastic. They're not planted, believe me, but that, that, yeah, spot on. Let's move on and we'll have a look at these then. So um, it's what it says on the tin, it, key performance indicator. They, they're going to enable you to set out at the earliest opportunity what your desired position is as a business. So what standards have been demanding? What does good look like? What is it that you want? What's the firm name way of doing things? So examples of key performance indicators would be around complaints, retention levels, record standards, behaviour standards. So complaints, do you have key performance indicators in terms of the volume, um, the resolution, in terms of um, how quickly they're handled with uh, retention levels? Have you got a minimum retention? Is there uh, standards in terms of you meeting retention targets in terms of communicating with your customer base? That sort of thing. We won't labour too much on this, but we're all the general consensus and understanding is on the right wavelength. So what are your responsibilities from a regulatory perspective? Um, the FCA source book, PRIN, which is the Principles for Business, um, specifically in Principle 3, sets out that the firm must reasonably organise and control its affairs with care and responsibility with adequate risk management systems. 
Principles for Business says that a firm must take reasonable care to organise and control its affairs responsibly and effectively. There isn't just a responsibility for the firm overall, they also need to con have considerations for the individual senior managers that are within the organisation. And the conduct rules take principle three even further and make it the senior manager's responsibility to ensure that the business of the firm for which that senior manager is responsible is controlled effectively. So what does this mean? That means things like having appropriate oversight, understanding of the business activity, being close enough to that activity to know what's happening in practice, remaining informed and up to date on what's going on. Ensuring that staff have the necessary tools at their disposal, including their training and competence programme, so that they are able to do their job is essential. It's not just individual staff members, it's those individuals that have been empowered to manage or supervise staff. So when you delegate functions internally from a senior manager level down to middle management and then that gets delegated tasks down to staff, you've got to have proper oversight of that to ensure that the individual at the top that has the ultimate responsibility is being appropriately informed. Training and competency frameworks. There is no one size fits all. It's not a simple off the shelf purchase. You can't take a template to task for your training and competence framework. It's impossible to be prescriptive on this. You can't apply the same scheme to a two person brokerage as a call centre staffed by, say, two to five hundred people. It's just not going to work. So firms need to consider how best to meet their commitments with TNC with a framework that works best for their business. So in terms of competency, you need to be understanding, do staff know their stuff? Um, do they constantly uh, have to ask for help? What support structures are there in place? Just because staff don't ask for help doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a thriving environment. It could be that you've not got the appropriate uh, support structures in place for them to be able to feel comfortable to ask for help. How do you assess their competency? Do you assess their competency? You've also got to think about remaining competent. Do staff continually update their knowledge? Can you prove that they are competent at any time? And do you test their competency? And again, how do you do that? One of the things that the regulator quite, uh, I was going to say likes to do, one of the things that they, they habitually do do is if they are getting under the skin of a firm and they want to understand more about um, the, the training and competence framework of an organisation, they will normally ask for a structure chart and they will break through that structure chart and they'll ask for evidence of competency for uh, a number of individuals, normally about half a dozen or so. And I suppose the question that I'd ask you to take away after this session is, could you do that exercise comfortably within your organisation? If you were to pick, say, six people at random within your firm, and ask yourself, how would we evidence that they are competent to fulfill the role that they're undertaking? Can you fulfill that? If you can't, you've got a gap that needs to be closed as soon as possible. You need to look at appropriate supervision. So new joiners, how do you benchmark them? How do you uh, evidence a progression of knowledge? Um, existing staff, how is competency maintained? You should look to adopt a risk based approach. It makes sense to focus on those individuals that pose the most risk to the firm. So, for example, a new starter with little or no experience, they're going to need more training and support, coaching, supervision than that of an experienced member of staff. Also, you've got regular review of competency, one to ones, six monthly or yearly appraisals, review of qualifications. They're really important towards um, regular reviews of competency, as well as your CPD, your continuing professional development. And in terms of the level of competency, do all employees need to know the same things? Do some employees need to be at a, a advanced or expert level? Uh, look at the products that you sell. What does someone need to know as a minimum? The Insurance Distribution Directive sets out that minimum level of knowledge. 
how do you evidence that people have obtained that minimum level of knowledge? Okay. Thanks, Steve. So um, what are the elements of a training and competency framework? So um, from a high level, they're these things that we've got on the slide here. Um, and if we think back to the rhetorical question that we asked a few slides ago, how many in the audience uh, would you say have got a, a, a training and competency framework which consists of just a subscription um, online learning platform, for example? Um, another question for you all to think about is how many of you have more than just an online development platform subscription, but due to resource pressures, perhaps you can't deliver any other aspects of the training and competency framework um, other than letting your staff have access to a development platform. So with all the will in the world, you might have the stuff that we've talked about, like classroom training, side by side, coaching, that kind of stuff. But as we know, due to the pressures, you know, business pressures, um, can everyone actually uh, deliver that? Um, the reality is that if you're not, if you're only relying on the um, online platform, then you would be falling short of the the regulatory training and competency requirements, and that means that businesses will suffer because of this. So, if you've got an all-rounded framework, obviously with all those elements we've talked about, that's going to empower the employee to provide a better service to your customers than just relying on, say, an online CPD platform. Um, so where do you start when putting a training and competency framework uh, together? So some things to look at uh, on the slide that we've got here are um, job specifications. So it's really important that you've got these in place because if an employee doesn't have a clear idea of what's expected from them, they're unlikely to be able to meet the standards that you're setting in the firm. And the job specification should um, show the tasks that are involved, uh, the knowledge that's required to carry out the role competently, the understanding and skills that the person needs to have to be able to apply that knowledge to the job tasks that they, they carry out. And also you should set out in there how the job should be carried out. So the, the com competency standard, so how your firm would like that employee to carry out um, that that role. Um, so something to think about is if you had to recruit to replace the role, would the job specification that you've got in place now help you to do that? Um, another thing is identifying job tasks. So what again, what does your firm expect? This can differ from one firm to another, from one account handler to another, uh, and it should reflect what the job is now and taking into account changes over time. So be mindful that of job evolution. So just because you've got a, a job specification that was written for, say, Doreen in 1992, it doesn't mean that, you know, that's going to still be applicable if Doreen left and you got a recruit for her role in 2022. So you need to make sure those are kept up to date. Um, job analysis. So that would be making sure that you recruit properly to drive your business forward, um, identifying learning needs and gaps. So once they're identified, how do you address the gaps that you've identified? Manage individual performance. So what does good versus poor look like and how is this managed? Um, often firms will have like training competency frameworks in place and file audits. Um, and, and measures like that, but they won't have something in place to sort of either reward good performance or how to deal with poor performance. So if someone's continually not performing to the standard, how do you deal with them? Have you got a process in place that you could link in with HR to, you know, deal with that? And that could be coaching and training to help them get back up to the, the standard required. Um, and as we said there, you need to make sure you are monitoring and managing poor performance. So are the consequences to that? Is the consistency in the approach from one member of staff to the other? 
and really making sure that the tail doesn't wag the dog. So, you, you know, you, you don't have all this good intention in place, but then do nothing with the results that you're getting out of the, the back of it. Um, so setting competency standards. So how so how do you do this? So think about um, how you would like it could be how you would like employees to speak to clients. Uh, I assume obviously everyone would like to speak them speak to clients politely um, and with respect. And it could be that you might want people to answer calls in a certain number of rings. Um, what should the handlers account execs do account handlers do if they don't know the answer refer if they got a designated referral point they can go to um, and a customer facing role as you can imagine will probably require excellent communication skills so you would set those out this is what we expect um, as a firm so again ask yourselves do you think you've got those structures in place at the moment within your businesses um, firms should be committed to treating customers fairly and view the training scheme as a significant component to meeting this objective. All members of staff should complete annual refresher training surrounding uh, treating customers fairly and should have a separate uh, firm should have a separate treating customers fairly high level policy document to further outline this. Um, within the compliance if you've got a compliance department and not all firms will if they're depending on size um, you should be looking at um, complaints and identifying root causes um, to report these along with any remedial work to the firm on a monthly basis um, this would include information about how you treat customers fairly and help improve the training and competency of all staff Complaint records should be maintained and any root cause analysis and feedback given to the red relevant heads of department and cascaded to relevant members of staff. Um, if you've got a training department, for example, so they can loop that back in to the training to, you know, say we've identified uh, this via root cause analysis from our complaints. So we need to try and give our staff some extra training on this particular area. Firms should encourage the highest professional and ethical standards in order to maintain the good reputation of the firm and all members of staff within the firm would be expected to behave with integrity, considering their wider responsibilities to society. This includes acting in a courteous, honest and fair manner uh, with anyone that they deal with. Now that links into the conduct rules, uh, which are set out in the senior management management and certification regime so hopefully everyone in the audience today has heard of the senior the SNCR and understands the conduct rules if anyone's struggling with that or hasn't heard of that before uh, you can contact us obviously for help with that if you, if you need to or you need more help with that so the conduct rules it's recommended that these are shown in within uh, employees contracts if applicable and are considered as part of annual appraisals as well so uh, thinking about the conduct rules do the individuals understand the conduct rules set out by the smcr and how they apply to the context of their role so it's all very well you know giving them the uh, a, a training pack to do say an online cpd but those conduct rules, what does it mean to them in the job that they do day to day? What does um, acting with integrity mean in the role that they do, for example? So you need to link those back to, to what they do. Again, bring it alive for them. So once once it, you bring it to life for them, they will understand it more. Um, and the key points there, Kay, as well, is that they you need to be able to evidence that staff understand yeah. The conduct rules in the context of their role as well yeah Quite, good and that's point, the bit the firms will fall down upon is how do you evidence that yeah thanks steve um next we'll talk a bit about recruitment so as part of your recruitment process you should be expecting candidates to seek some sort of assessment for the role that they would uh, they, they want to fulfill um, in some cases candidates will be expected to provide an, a 
evidence record of previous training and CPD assessments that they've taken if the role requires that. So depending on the type of role that it is. So, for example, if you were employing someone in uh, compliance or training, for example, then you'd want to see that, you know, what, what have they done previously that, that can back up that they've got that experience and knowledge. Um, so, again, ask yourselves how many of you have got that sort of mechanism in place to do that. Um, the firm may also uh, want to obtain certified copies of certificates where someone's got qualifications, uh, which forms part of influences or suitability for a job role. So, for example, if your minimum is that you want to employ someone that's uh, got cert CII, you might want to be asking for the certificates to show that they have actually got that qualification. Um, firms should provide copies of its uh, treating customers fairly and ethical behaviour standards and uh, obtain written consent from the candidate to adhere to these. Again, have a look if you know you've got these mechanisms in place. Also, firms must provide a copy or access to their staff handbook. Um, I come across a lot of firms in my role because I look after about 30 um, insurance brokers that don't have staff handbooks and, and and such like so that's something integral that you should have and again something that if you haven't got you can get in touch with us and we, we can help you uh, with that. Uh, where it's deemed necessary uh, you must obtain previous employer references uh, this is a regulatory requirement so regulatory referencing has time parameters which have to be adhered to for both the request and receipt and firms must have documented procedures in place for this. So recruitment for senior managers. So if you're recruiting someone into a senior manager function role, uh, the important thing to remember here is the employee cannot take up the duties of that role until they've been approved by the FCA. So under the what was the approved person regime, <laughs> which is now senior manage, manager um, certification regime. In addition um, to following the recruitment procedure, as we've talked about on previous slides, uh, the firm will make such additional inquiries into these individuals, such as DBS uh, credit checks, um, where, uh, as it deems appropriate so that they can satisfy themselves of the fitness and propriety of uh, anyone that's going to come into those senior manager roles. The FCA expects firm senior managers to continue to uh, uh, senior manager to be continually assessed on a risk based approach. And this should uh, include a combination of checks, including credit references, which we've talked about, uh, references from previous employees and criminal record checks as appropriate for the role they're moving into. Individuals applying for approvals from the FCA should be open and honest and any misleading information, including non-disclosure of criminal records, is an offence under Section 398 of FISMA. Um, financial services firms and the FCA are now able to consider all spent offences rather, uh, rather than just relevant spent offences when applying for an approved person status. This is because there was an amendment to the Rehabilita Rehabilitation Offenders Act 1974 um, to change this. So it doesn't just look at the person's what they've done in relation to working in financial services capacity, but other it's wider than that. So you need to look at their um, fitness and propriety from a wider point of view also. So we were just going to ask at this point to put some more answers in the chat to this question. So before we move on, um, can we ask how many of you are on the call who already got a formalised um, induction programme in place for new starters that come into your business? And what does this look like? Just briefly, what, what does that um, entail within your firm? Thanks, Kay. So the question was, uh, who has a formal induction plan and, and what is it? 
um, entail. Yeah. And we've had some cracking answers on the other ones, so I'm, I'm, I have every confidence <laughs> in the in the group. Ah, here we go. Ashley, two week induction, formal sign off from process product knowledge tests. Brilliant. Good. Just the one. <laughs> well, I think we've got others typing. I guess okay. there's I guess there's quite a lot that goes into the induction and it's, it's a, uh, there we go. So uh, Keely, uh, yes, we do online learning on policies, two or three hour session with learning development manager, ongoing assessment, ass assessment, including observations after three months, uh, including role plays, which is um, oh, impressive. Uh, Nick, yes, and varies from role to role. Carl, uh, yes, we have one at Towergate Advisory and it matches um, what Ashley had said before. Uh, ben has says that Aston Lark have a corporate induction day. When you start and follow up, sign off, the right. more you learn. Good. So, so um, I'm going to be teaching you guys preaching to the converted here, I think, at, at this point. But um, <laughs> let's just have a look at the the induction program then. So um, new joiners should be presented with uh, a detailed schedule of training. Um, your methods of testing and checking um, of the understanding of an individual that, that would include things like online learning and development zone modules, classroom based training, competency tests, quizzes, role play assessments, uh, systems training. Um, a lot of what you, you, you should be familiar to you in the induction process. So for a typical new employee, um, they should undertake a new joiner process upon commencing employment with the firm. Um, there should be a relevant period set. Typically, I've heard four weeks banded around in some of those answers. Um, typically, four weeks of employment. You should have completed your health and safety procedures, um, systems, your staff handbook, uh, compliance, training, competency and disaster recovery plans and procedures gone through basic office practices and procedures, um, the referral and complaints procedure, training on computer systems and operation, uh, a general welcome tour of the building, um, more specifically of each department within the firm. It's really important getting that from the, the first out, outlier of the brand that you represent to the last touch with an existing customer. It's really important to take somebody through that journey so that they understand the, the, the full spectrum of, of, of why the business and how the business exists. Um, CPD training and requirements um, includes things like completing the new relevant new starter induction program. Get that recorded on the CPD record. Um, a lot of firms kind of fall down and miss that is that they, they under, undertake a lot of training and development. It just doesn't get logged on CPD. Um, training on all relevant processes and procedures relating to the employee's job role. You must and the individual must be able to show competency, including the systems that they use. So you know, things like telephones, live chat, that type of stuff, if that's pertinent to your firm, make sure that you're documenting and evidencing competency around that. Um, new employees should be able to begin their role with the supervision of a direct report. New employees, line managers should also complete and document sign off processes once competency has been achieved. And a supervisor should ensure that there's some form of testing, whether that be mock tests, audits, something that's in place to assess an evidence competency. And regular meetings should be documented as well to discuss progression, analyse results and document any issues or concerns. So um, during the induction period, um, staff members must be appropriately supervised with up to 100% of work monitored, um, fielding telephone calls, uh, live chats, that type of thing should be done under supervision and having a um, having completed the relevant training um, firms complaints procedures should be trained. You might want to consider the introduction of say a buddy system where new employees can be accompanied by a competent person that helps to demonstrate and lead them through a typical day to day environment. Um, it helps to aid the development and um, confirmation of those practical skills that will evidence 100% competency. It's for the firms to decide on which methods to use when assessing employee competence. Um, 
competency is often defined as having the skills, knowledge, expertise needed to discharge the responsibilities of an employee's role. So it includes achieving a good standard of ethical behaviour. Um, it's not just a question of having the appropriate qualifications and meeting the requirements of the SMCR um, or the Code of Conduct. Firms need procedures in place with clear criteria for individuals to be assessed as being competent. So all parties that are involved understand when competence has been reached. And you must review competency regularly. Um, training needs analysis that runs off the back of an appraisal would be an ideal opportunity. Uh, an assessment of competency will feed a training needs analysis and will set a training regime for an individual. So you need to consider changes in the marketplace and changes to your products, regulation, any legislation legislation changes. So an example would be the recent developments and changes um, in the FCA pricing practices side of things and the product governance requirements. Um, again, if these are unfamiliar terms to anybody in the audience, then let us know afterwards. Um, you need to look at the skills, expertise and technical knowledge and behaviour of your employees in the practice of their role. Um, you should make sure that appropriate training is provided so employees remain competent. You need to monitor and assess regularly the training's effectiveness to make sure that it meets your core objectives of why that training has been put in place in the first place. It makes sense that if the product that you're training or the procedure that you're training is ever evolving, the training needs to evolve as well to keep up, to keep it um, relevant and up to date and deliver. Competency um, should be monitored continuously throughout. So monthly auditing, um, individual meetings between employees and their supervisors or managers. Um, this will further help to develop uh, CPD, uh, coaching and mentoring. Complaints and customer feedback, that's crucial part to maintaining competency for the firm. So the tools that you have available to you from root cause analysis, uh, from identifying why complaints have occurred, um, you should utilise these to in encourage better results for staff, um, identify gaps in knowledge or internal processes. So before we move on, uh, probably coming towards the last question for the day would be how many of the audience have quality and monitoring arrangements in place? And the question that we'd ask is, you know, what do they consist of? OK, thanks, Stephen. Whilst whilst we get answers to that question, there was another induction one uh, from Nikki um, right. from before but induction program on the first day with IT and HR, and then it's passed out to the team manager. But um, they're implementing a full training and competency framework and they have That's online awesome. pathways and policies. So another you know another contributor that's got things in place but but perhaps looking to to also strengthen i sometimes feel like a professional padder in these <laughs> uh webinars just while people type because um we we ask you know challenging yeah. questions we've got to give people a moment to to think about yeah. them but um i i'm desperately waiting for something to come through there that's okay I'm surprised we haven't had anything in the chat, Steve, about the uh, picture on the wall behind you. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're fortunate that nobody has mentioned that. Right, we've got one now from Keeley. So uh, yes, audits, dev zone, and two monthly modules relevant to role for all. Full in, full induction program, including complaints and all mentioned during webinar. All the things mentioned during the webinar, regular one to ones, review and training needs. Okay. So. Cool, brilliant. Yeah, so we are on the right wavelengths there. So, um, yep. Yep. Kay, would you like to come in on, on the uh, quality and monitoring framework side of things? Yes, so um, we've talked about uh, file audits um, and quality monitoring. So uh, let's think about what a quality monitoring strategy or auditing should consist of. So that could be um, file audits. Um, it could be call monitoring if you do record your calls. I know not every firm do, but if you have call recording in place, um, it would be a real, really good idea to use that as part of your um, auditing 
strategy, uh, you need to consider a proportionate approach, which is defined by the volume of business that you do and the complexity of the business that you do. So you should work out how many checks you're going to do per handler per month or per quarter, depending on uh, volume and complexity. Think about how the feedback's given. So it's no good doing file audits or call monitoring uh, and not giving feedback. Um, you know, you've got to you've got to back that up and tell the, the person what they've done good or, or where they might have gaps. Um, and that helps to provide staff with the tools to be able to develop their level of competency. Mm -hmm. Uh, management of poor performance we've talked about before. So off the back of those file audits, the results that you get out of it, you need to have some structure in place to deal with any poor performance as well. Think about appraisals and linking in with your HR department if you've got a HR person or department. Bonus gateways. So think about do you give your staff bonuses and how does that link into your file audits? Have you got gateways in place? Because do bonus bonuses drive the correct behaviours? Um, are there any unwanted behaviours? So file auditing and call monitoring is a way to make sure that people aren't just, you know, selling products or answering calls quickly to, to get a bonus, that kind of stuff. They've got to have the quality in there as well, be doing the right thing and treating the customer fairly. Um, so supervisors, this forms part of the training and competency framework. So you, you should make sure that employees are always supervised. How closely the individual is supervised will depend on their experience and whether they've already been assessed as competent. The level and intensity of supervision should be significantly greater before competency is achieved. So as we said, new starters from a risk-based approach will need more supervision than someone that's already deemed competent. Um, you should have a clear criteria and procedures in place to define, uh, to identify, sorry, the specific point at which the individual becomes competent so they can prove when and why a reduced level of supervision is warranted. Supervision should not just involve file checking. Um, it should be an all round, as we've talked about before, not just file checking there. So what about supervisors? They need to be also be deemed suitably competent in their role. Um, if they supervise an employee who advises retail clients on retail investment products, they need to have the appropriate technical knowledge and coaching and assessment skills to be a supervisor of that person. Um, there's no specific requirement for supervisor to pass an appropriate qualification. However, they should have technical knowledge and coaching and assessing skills to be competent, uh, a competent supervisor and assessor. Firms need to consider whether they wish supervisors to hold an appropriate qualification and ultimately firms should be able to explain their decision as if you decide that that's not necessary. Um, so record keeping, this is a really important part of the training and competency framework. So you need to make sure that you keep records on every, anything that relates to your training and competency compliance. And these uh, also need to keep records of staff recruitment, training competency assessments, staff supervision, any appropriate qualifications for any activity relating to training and competence. And those records should be kept for at least three years after stopping the activity. So CPD and qualifications. So the FCA um, commitments require that staff remain competent and this is regularly reviewed. Um, as a result, it's necessary for staff members to undertake a, a reassessment of their knowledge. So you might do it at induction, but you've got to make sure that they have reassessments throughout their, their career. Um, all employees involved in insurance distribution must undertake a programme of continuing personal development, CPD, in order to maintain and develop their existing standards. Uh, the structure and content of the continuing training and development programme should ensure that the activities completed are relevant to the individual's needs. And in order to demonstrate this, an annual assessment of competencies and training needs needs to be carried out with their supervisor uh, before developing a training plan for the coming year. The emphasis 
and they should be on quality rather than um, quantity. And in line with the IDD, the Insurance Distribution Directive, the firm requires should require all members of staff to complete 15 hours of CPD per year and to ensure that this is fulfilled and documented. Also, if uh, staff hold qualifications such as CERT CII, then they've got to adhere to the uh, minimum 35 hours of CPD. So to ensure balanced learning, think about the uh, following activities uh, where they're appropriate for the person's particular job. So professional examinations, we've talked about CII, for example, appropriate and relevant internal or external courses, specialist product knowledge, uh, so training on um, insurers and the, their literature, uh, specialist reading in the trade, press journals, mentoring um, from senior staff can mentor junior staff, for example, in market practices, and soft skills training, so face-to-face -face coaching, IT courses, uh, things like that. Ultimately, it's the supervisor's responsibility to ensure that the type and level of C CPD that's undertaken is relevant to their staff members' training and development needs. Um, with, this is a theme running through. Make sure you record all CPD activity because um, you've got to be able to, it's no good just doing it if you, if you don't record it and be able to evidence it as well. OK, so um, appraisals and performance reviews. So the main objective of an appraisal and performance or development review is to create a performance partnership between the firm and the employee. Um, it helps to meet FCA requirements and, and um, it helps you to regularly review the employee's training needs. Um, it allows employees to understand what is expected of them and develop their knowledge, skills and competence so that performance standards are maintained and can be improved. Um, you should adopt a philosophy of helping individuals, helping them to achieve results necessary to meet scheme key performance indicators. Um, education, ad hoc training, development and assessment will all contribute to this as well as on the job training. Um, there are principles of appraisals. You know, they should cover all of your employees. Um, the purpose of the performance review is not merely to comment on past outcomes, but should also be designed and conducted to influence uh, or change future performance and behaviour. Um, you should ensure that fairness and consistency of judgment is essential um, uh, to, to the policy and that all employees should have an equal opportunity um, to achieve their full potential and shouldn't be discriminated against where they are agreeing objectives or where involved in a performance review process. Um, the review process should be based on reasonable objectives and expectations and each individual should involve regular review pr uh, processes. Um, performance reviews provide an opportunity for employees to receive and discuss feedback on their performance, um, that type of thing. So employees should, where possible, be encouraged to, to view performance um, as a joint process with responsibility for the achievement of objectives falling on both the employee and the organisation. The board ultimately has accountability for compliance, the tone from the top forms a vital element of establishing the conditions of honesty and integrity and they can fashion the behaviour of your employees. Um, so it does not absolve all employees from the responsibility of their own actions, but a poor from, tone from the top does account for how dishonest actions are able to occur in the first place. You know, boards must retain adequate oversight of compliance. We talked about that earlier in the slides, about being close enough to the activity to understand what's happening from a practical sense. Um, systems and controls should be designed to make sure that outcomes are accurately reported and the framework should represent a credible ethical basis upon which the firm can operate its business. And almost all of the uh, regulatory frameworks will be founded on the principles of ethical behaviours. So it follows that the values of ethics and integrity must be in place before any compliance framework is implemented. If the values of the company and those that work within it are not set or monitored, the framework will not work properly. Um, and it's important to note that for TNC to be effective, it must relate to your business practices. So real examples should be used to reinforce the regulatory requirements being discussed. Too often we go into business and we hear the FCA require us to do this. Actually, to, to get it competent within your organisation, it should be um, we want you to do this because that's your ethical approach as a business. 
So recap on today's objectives. Um, you should all by now have a better understanding of uh, the regulator's approach to TNC, insight into what competency means. You should have considered the commitments and arrangements of your firm to TNC. Uh, you may have identified some gaps in your existing procedures. Um, hopefully we've given you some clear insight into how competency standards should be defined. And some of you may have identified some shortcomings in your existing framework. And finally, we've outlined what a robust TNC framework should consist of. Um, we suspect that there's going to be some takeaway and work for everybody in today's audience to go uh, back and uh, some improvements that can be made irrespective of where on the, the spectrum you find yourself. Um, just to say we are, we are here to help if you want to reach out to us or through Ecclesiastical, we're here to support you where possible. And the one thing that I would let get you to um, make sure you remember is don't forget to record this session on your CPD because it can count towards that. <laughs>